So we're going to talk about art tonight. Thank you all for attending my presentation this evening. And uh, in the last decade, I've been working on two narrative mosaic series, and the last of which I have just completed. So tonight, I will discuss the two artistic styles that are used and the art movements they belong to. As most of you know, styles of artistic output are referred to by generally approved definitions. One branch of postmodernism, which appeared late in the movement, is called critical postmodern. This branch is based on the postmodern assertion that all artist perspectives are valid. But unlike postmodernism, the critical postmodern thought holds that greater understanding of society is possible by viewing it through the lens of narratives. I read several articles on critical postmodern movement which explain that such artworks are often highly crafted, crafted than more highly crafted than postmodern works, uh, more accessible and more communicative. Also, it is said that critical postmodern artist is ethically engaged in the act of creation rather than being ironically detached, as in the case of the postmodern thought. Also, I'm pleased to report this, that since the 2013 Venice Biennale, the narrative has become entrenched in visual art vocabulary and performance. The Guggenheim Museum has been showing an exhibition called Storylines Contemporary Art at the Guggenheim, a group exhibition examining how artists today forge new paradigms for storytelling. Now, I've been telling stories in my art since the 1980s when such art was hardly considered cutting edge. I maintain that no matter what ism is in fashion, an artist's role is to listen, to question, and to expose. So, in view of society's ever-changing ideologies, I formulate my own personal vision while remaining true to myself. For the last 20 years, my work has asserted the powerful female. I look to mythological and biblical stories of courageous females who, despite the overwhelming odds against their success, have prevailed through sheer courage and wise decisions. In my works, these figures are used as metaphors and act as role models for a contemporary society. The Bible offers humanity profound insight into tough political and personal issues. The fascinating biblical books of Esther and Judith inspired me to recreate these stories through my own artistic distilled vision. Terrible things happen in both stories. The book of Esther includes a plot of genocide, a family's execution, and the slaying of thousands. The Judith story speaks of the gory beheading of Assyrian General Holofernes by a Jewish widow who single-handedly saves a whole town from slavery. But, as with most ancient religion texts derived from an oral tradition and written for a less educated, mostly illiterate audience, the books of Esther and Judith must be understood not just literally, but also metaphorically. In my narrative series, these two stories with their associations in myth and execution in Byzantine smalti express a contemporary message. Each story promotes an individual, particularly a woman's sacrifice and determination to defend the liberty of her people. Throughout history, throughout the world, individuals and minorities, men and women alike, have struggled against fierce odds to obtain and preserve their basic human rights. The common motif in the Esther series, in other words, the unifying motif which holds the whole series consistent and connected, is the wrought iron lattice which appears in each and every mosaic. The idea behind a decorative lattice is representative of women's oppression in ancient societies. The symbolism of the motif varies from mosaic to mosaic depending on the story scene. So from left to right, you can follow the story chronologically, starting with a young, rich, but unhappy and lonely Esther in Xerxes' harem. 
Following that are important scenes of the story, ending the final victorious Esther, now a more mature woman who removes her mask and reveals her identity. The stories of Esther and Judith illuminate the fundamental truth that one individual, not only a group, can and does make a difference. I suggest that in my work, my perspective is an unabashedly postmodern expression that focuses upon the individual as exemplar of a larger group. The medium of mosaic is admirably suited for the contemporary reconstruction of these two ancient stories. I cut this mount to glass, deconstruction, then assembled those tesserae to form new shapes which thus acquire new life. Judith, who is before you now, is the flip side of Esther. She is a warrior from the get-go. For her, I require action poses to suit her hands-on personality, as she totally relies on herself to save her community by beheading the enemy. So the Baroque style I use consists of more naturalistic spatial arrangements and visual appearance compared to the Esther stylized forms and flat decorative backgrounds. It is interesting that in art, the terms Byzantine and Baroque depict two completely different styles belonging to separate eras in history. Yet in modern day terminology, these two words are usually, usually used pejoratively, almost as synonyms, as both refer to something excessively complex, indirect, or obscure in language to the extent of concealing or confusing the meaning. My intent, of course, was nothing of the kind. Because Judith acted heroically and courageously on her own until the end, I expressed the series fluidity of movement through dramatic poses, theatrical gestures, and emotional expressions. For the Judith series, I chose a white sketchbook page with a perforated top as the unifying motif. The transition from the black and white pencil sketch to monochromatic 2D and finally to full color indicates a gradual rejuvenation of an ancient story through its retelling. The sketchbook page with its black and white graphite drawing is a 21st century prop. The images of the heroine's plight and fighting spirit, dressed in biblical clothing and in ancient surroundings, provide a bridge across the centuries. Mosaics, by definition, are made up of small individual bits incorporated into large artworks. In our world, in 21st century is becoming, well, actually, our world in the 21st century is becoming more and more fractured. So the archetypal story of individualism can be compared to fragmented elements being made whole again. We can't heal the world until we heal ourselves. This century sees digital technology producing a genuine language when used creatively. Computer technology inspires countless contemporary artists and mosaics, more than any other medium, reflect its inherent digital system. Every digital image consists of pixels or small colored particles, much like the pointless colored dots or the tesserae in a mosaic. The more pixels an image contains, the richer the image. The same applies to mosaic language. A variety of small tesserae in many shades will give more detail and richness to the artwork. For me, the image is always paramount, and the method of execution serves the image. I have erroneously been called a religious artist, but religion is not only a story of faith, it is a story of history and social values. Today, we're creating a new religion, worshiping the technology we have created. Perhaps in the same way, my messages are subtle, hidden from the beauty of the glass tesserae and the images. So this is an Esther Judith comparison, two different styles. The two mosaics are both diptychs, depicting similar scenes when the two women face the dominating and controlling alpha male in their respective stories. In the Esther diptych, you can see the stylized throne, 
The formal yet static poses of both figures, the shallow depth of field, a less naturalistic background with decorative motifs, and the wrought iron lattice I talked about. These are all Byzantine features, especially the abundance of gold tesserae, which is an important aspect in Byzantine traditional depiction of biblical images. By contrast, the Judith diptych, is, there's hardly any gold used there, aside from the jewelry worn by Holofernes and Judith. The poses and the faces are very demonstrative. The clothes are convoluting, flying as if in strong wind. The background indicates a tent interior with folds and fringe curtains. There's also a crumpled carpet, all of this suggesting action and movement. Another comparison. Two more diptychs depicting banquets. Here you see the Esther mosaic with two frontal, static, and formal poses. A stylized approach to both costumes and background. The wrought iron lattice now becoming the barred windows, which always covered the women's quarters. The, the safety element which men insisted on. In the Judith banquet scene, where she plies the general with wine to get him drunk, the bodies are intertwined and again, clothes are folded, rumpled, facial expressions are emphasized. I used a naturalistic approach overall in order to portray a courageous Judith determined to achieve her goal, to destroy the enemy all by herself. Another comparison. Esther curtsying and Judith praying. Esther at her coronation in a formal full frontal pose, scared, yet in full control. Wrought iron bars at the window suggest a restrictive new life behind bars. The lioness head is a symbol of royalty, power, and leadership, both in the Persian lore and in the Hebrew line of Judah. By the way, symbolism is a typical feature in Byzantine art. In this mosaic, I use the stylized head of a lioness, which is exactly as it appears on existing ruins of the palace in Persepolis. I also use it in the design of her dress. I hope it's, I hope it's visible on the screen. And I know I had a, can you see it? Here, and I'm too close, but somewhere here. So that unifies the two cultures. Okay, now on the right, Judith is concentrate, concentrating in prayer. And although seated, she appears in a twisted pose, gesticulating, headdress and scarf flowing, all of it suggesting movement and action. The transition from a line to full volume articulates the revitalization of this ancient story through a 21st century personal vision. There is symbolism in the Judith mosaics as well. There isn't really enough time to discuss it tonight, but in this mosaic, light from the oil lamp stands for the divine. Last comparison. A frightened Esther is running back to her quarters, hoping she remains unseen by royal court spies. She has just received from her uncle uh, Mordechai the Prime Minister Haman's written edict condemning all Israelites to death. Although expressive, Esther's stylized figure remains static in an icon-like pose, the traditional Byzantine frontal pose. The wrought iron lattice motif is now window bars which point to her lack of personal freedom in the harem. And on the right, a frightened Judith is running back to her town of Betulia after beheading the enemy General Holofernes in his tent. Here, one can see the drama unfolding through the facial expressions, the swirl of her scarf, and the flowing garments of both Judith and her maid. After extensive research of the historical period in which these stories take place, I begin with sketching from models many, many sketches which ultimately get painted as mosaic cartoons. These become guides 
for the duration of the mosaic execution. In creating a mosaic, the medium dictates the outcome of a work of art and not the other way around. Because unlike any other artistic discipline, the glass itself possesses an integrity that can never be subdued, as opposed to oil paints, acrylics, pencils, charcoal, and conte, all of which obey the will of the artist, as you can see in these preparatory sketches for the Judy series here. So the Esther mosaics were executed mostly in the reverse method. I won't elaborate on the method that you see in the next few slides because the documentary is explicit. The documentary is on the Esther series, but also because all of you are familiar with mosaic making. So you now this is the, uh, the Judith mosaics, which are executed in a direct method on mesh or plastic. Plastic is that sticky film. Uh, do you call it plastic in the US? Oh, in Canada it's plastic. Next. Yeah, so this is Esther Mosaics in progress and working on paper and in the reverse method. I'm sure all of you know about that. And then this is Judith working in the direct method. And uh, in this series, as I said earlier, there is a naturalistic approach to the Judith figures, and this includes anatomical andamenti, uh, which was absent in the Byzantine style. So you may be able to see the tesserae really following the curvature of the muscles and the bones. So now the flipping, flipping the mosaics in the Esther series uh, in the reverse method. On top, you see the Esther mosaic, the first one I've ever done. Keep in mind, this is 2002. My very first mosaic and horror of horrors. I discovered that some of the vitreous tiles that I've used <laughs> were translucent. So you know what happened, everybody. The thin set altered the color of the, the flesh tone. It was uh, very upsetting to say the, list, the least, but live and learn the hard way. Now, by contrast, flipping the Judith mosaics, this time with help. After spending seven years executing the Esther mosaics on my own, I decided to get help with the cutting and gluing in the Judith series. Unlike the Esther mosaics, these are much larger, and they would have taken me much longer than seven years to complete. So I looked for possible assistance in my hometown, Vancouver, but really failed to find anyone who was interested or who had any knowledge of mosaics. So I called Mosaica Studio in Montreal, whom I've known since 2003, and I asked them if they want to work on just parts of my mosaics. And I was surprised, they said yes. You see, they're mosaic fabricators, and they do huge, huge murals and floors for large companies. And all I needed is parts of some mosaics. It worked really well. So I figured that I actually saved three years by farming pieces out. So um, you can see here, um, buttering the panels and flipping, it goes so fast when five people are doing it. So this is the exhibition of Queen Esther in a Vancouver gallery. Uh, as you can see, the preparatory sketches and cartoons are exhibited along the mosaics. And um, again, this is another Queen Esther exhibition, this time in Toronto. It's a wonderful space for mosaics, this very, very large uh, public gallery. Uh, again, the sketches and the cartoons are exhibited alongside, and I want to tell you that the Judith series will be exhibited in the same space in May 2016. Now, the gallery has curved walls, you can see, and they curve up two floors. It looks like a, a mini Guggenheim Museum. Now, the, the uh, Judith series has not been exhibited yet. Uh, my first exhibition of the Judith Mosaics will be in five weeks. So 
what I'm showing you here is a few shots of me with the mosaic so that you get an idea how large they are. So this is uh, the end. I hope that some of you may be able to come to my opening. If not, maybe come to Vancouver and see the exhibition during the five and a half month run anyway. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions now or do you want to wait until... I did. I wrecked my back. <laughs> You'll see it in the movie. There is one scene in the film, in the documentary, I have one man, through all, all of the Esters, one man in me. And it, it was crazy, because after I saw how they flipped, like in the previous, and when I thought the way I did it, I can't believe we managed to not screw up anything, because we didn't actually tie the, the, the sandwich. We didn't. They screwed together the, yeah, before yeah. flipping. I didn't. I just put it like this and turn it. Oh, and it you was... do it for two people on one end. It's one person on one end, and it's really heavy, and then you have to flip it really fast. Exactly. Yeah. And the ones that I flipped were, well, you will see in the documentary, very large, and it's very difficult. Yes? Why did you decide to change from um, reverse that is a very good question. It's a very good question because I, I enjoyed working the reverse. But for one thing, uh, for for one thing, the 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 paper itself, the way I written the reverse was the paper, and I had to wet it because. Do you know how long it takes me to do a, one of these? It takes me almost a year because I go over and over the expressions of the faces. That's what takes the longest. So I destroy, the following morning I take apart everything. It's, it's just terrible. So I kept wetting that paper so many times and I, I got tired of it. Also because at the time I wasn't using small tea. You see, I started with vitreous like everybody else. I worked in Vancouver in 2002 in a total vacuum. I had no, I was self-taught, nobody, I didn't know about Sam, I didn't know anything. I just did it on my own. Uh, actually, I had bought on eBay a book on Eric Fisher. Does anybody know Eric Fisher? He was the first man who wrote about uh, mosaics. He wrote a whole book on how ancient mosaics were made and uh, he died, uh, I think about 15 years ago, but the book was old. And I read that and I thought, well, I'll follow the way he did. Except that I didn't work with stone, I worked with uh, that vitreous. And, and I did not have any, and when you look at the film, you'll see, I did not have any skin tone. Because in vitreous at the time, and we're talking 2002, 2003, there was nothing. So I had to mix and match and it, it, it was very frustrating. So I got tired of, of doing it that way. Also, you will see in the film, I never did what most of you, I don't know how you need to do this, is that you take a picture and you put it underneath and then you put the uh, transparent uh, contact sheet, as you call it, on top and you see right through. Well, what I did for years and years and years is take that painted uh, little cartoon, I call it, I kept it like that and I had my table with the entire mosaic just drawn. And I, I just did it from looking until somebody said to me, why don't you just enlarge this completely to the size of the mosaic? But, uh, but even that was difficult because you have to bend over to work in the middle. And then I, Mireille, my back went. So now I cut that in smaller pieces and I work in smaller pieces and then I amalgamate everything. But this took years and years because no, there was nobody there to show me. Any other question? Okay, so the documentary will come now. There was